Okay, in this session, we're going to talk about the little dragon, which is here in this pellet case. What is it? It's a little self-contained unit that can produce warm, moist air that we can give to the casualty. How does it do it? It does it through a chemical reaction between the carbon dioxide in the air, or the air we breathe out, and some medical soda lime inside it. Why do we want to be able to produce warm, moist air for the casualty? Well, when we go caving, we dress for our caving activity. You know, I want to be not too hot, not too cold while I'm moving through the cave. So if I become a casualty for any reason, I'm likely to be um, not moving. Um, I'm going to be sitting on the cold rock, I'm going to be getting cold. And when we talk about cold casualties, we don't just mean that my hands feel a little bit cold, or my fingers feel a little bit cold, or my feet feel a little bit cold, rather. We're talking about actual, you know, real cooling down of the body, core cooling of the body, what medically we talk about as being hypothermia. Okay, so hypothermia has some serious effects on the body. It can affect my thinking, it can affect the way my muscles work, and it also can affect my blood chemistry as well. And this is really important um, for casualties who are injured. You know, majority of casualties in cave rescue, you know, will have suffered some kind of injury. Um, and the changes in the blood chemistry that come along with getting cold and uh, being injured, you know, it's just not a good combination at all. It's not a good combination at all. You know, it affects the way my blood clots and how I can keep that um, those blood clots going. So it's really important that as a rescue team, we have an approach to deal with hypothermic casualties. We need to stop that and reverse that if we can. And the little dragon is one of the approaches that we've got for dealing with hypothermic casualties. We've got lots of insulation and shelter. We might give the casualty some food if that's appropriate to so keep their energy levels up. And um, we might also try and actively heat them through hot packs and um, the heated jacket that we're going to talk about later as well. So uh, the little dragon is just one method that we've got for trying to warm up our casualty and um, keep their core temperature up, prevent this nasty problem that, that can happen um, as they cool. Okay, so I'm going to have a look now inside the case. Nice bright yellow pelly case, obvious label on it that tells, it, tells us what it is. So let's have a look, see what is inside. Okay, well, we've got some instructions, useful, should you need a reminder of how to use the unit. We've got a bin bag, very useful to create a clear, clean space on the floor for you to lay the unit out on. And the other really important stuff about cleanliness is obviously that we've got some PPE in here. We've got our sort of standard COVID kind of kit, um, but, you know, cross-contamination, Personal protection is really important at every time, but this has got some masks in, it's got some gloves, some hand cleanser, and there's some wipes there as well. And rather than use those, um, I'm just going to use the stuff that's already out here on the table rather than open those. So, you know, as I said, it's really important. Keep your hands clean, keep yourself protected. Don't really want to transfer anything from me to the casualty at any time, um, whether it's in the current COVID situation or in the future where COVID may be um, less of a concern. But as I said, don't want to transfer things from me to the casualty or from the casualty to me. Um, the other thing is that, as I said, this unit requires a dedicated operator, uh, one person who's gonna, whose job it is to monitor and use the unit. Um, so it's really important that they do the setting up, they do the taking apart, they do the administering. Um, you know, particularly, as I said, in COVID at the moment, we're minimising our interactions between members of the team and the casualty, particularly in close proximity. So, as I said, I've got ways of keeping the kit clean when I'm laying it out. I've got ways of protecting me. Really important. So what other things do I find in the box? I find that there's a mask. I find that there is a little temperature uh, probe and assembly there. I find that there's a couple of plastic tubes, one insulated, one uninsulated. Um, I then f <coughs> find that I've got the main unit itself. Um, this has got one permanently connected pipe and various other inlets that we'll come to in a moment. Um, I find that there's a bottle brush inside the box, really important, very important, come to that. And I then find that there's a carbon dioxide cylinder and a plastic handle assembly there that allows us um, to deliver the carbon dioxide into the unit to get the reaction going. 
Okay, so what am I going to do first? What am I going to assemble first? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take the main unit and the bottle brush. Um, the reason I'm going to use this is that in the main large central hole here, which is actually the outlet, was the air, as it were, going to the casualty. I'm just going to give that a brush out. Okay. The reason I do that is because the unit has probably been bounced around on its way into the cave. Um, the soda line may have been shaken a little bit. A little bit of dust may have generated in there, and I just want to clean that dust out. Um, so a bottle brush is the ideal way of doing that and involves me blowing or spitting into the unit, obviously, as well. Um, the dust isn't caustic. We don't use caustic soda lime or anything like that these days. Um, but the dust going into the casualty lungs, it could make them cough. It's, it's just not needed. So very important. Any time you've taken the unit apart, packed it away, you've got it out. First thing you should do, give that a good clean and a good brush out to ensure there's no dust in it. Fantastic. The next thing I'm going to do is actually charge the unit up with its initial burst of carbon dioxide. So what do I do? Take the top off the carbon dioxide cylinder, little plastic cap, put that somewhere safe. Then I take the handle and I'm going to actually screw that onto the top of this. Now, important to note that this is a plastic thread. This is a metal thread, plastic metal. There is the possibility that if I cross thread it, um, I won't actually be able to get a tight enough seal on here to use this correctly um, and effectively render the unit uh, useless, of no help to me at all. So really important that when I screw these together, I do it very gently and I make sure that I don't cross thread it. See, when I'm screwing that down. All I'm just using, just one finger, just turning that. That's all I need. You might hear a little hiss as the mechanism engages and it only just needs a little nip up, nothing more than that. Okay, so now I'm going to connect it up and this, the little nozzle on the plastic handle here, connects onto the permanent tube that is connected onto the, the base unit. And you might think, well, why do I want to put the CO2 in it first? And the reason for that is that it, it avoids having any excess of CO2, which will maybe vent through the unit, being in the mask or in any of the pipe work. Okay, I don't want to give the um, casualty any extra CO2 um, you know, it is just to start the exothermic reaction inside. So having connected it up, I'm going to give it an initial five to six seconds of carbon dioxide. So a slow count to five or six. One, two, three, four, five. Brilliant. I take that off and now I'm going to put this away again. We never leave the handle and the cylinder attached um, because if it squeezes and it vents all the CO2 out, I've effectively rendered the unit useless. Um, obviously, the expansion of this carbon dioxide out of this may well cool the cylinder. Do be careful of that. Do be aware of that um, when you're taking it apart. OK, so I take it apart, put it back into the box. Obviously, very important that this box stays with the casualty so that if this is needed to give a boost to the unit, it's available instantly. So, I'm now going to put the rest together. Okay, so what have we got? We've got the small uninsulated tube. That one goes on the one opposite, on this particular unit, opposite that permanent tube, and it's marked as inlet. We don't actually need to put this on, but it is useful, um, particularly if we were to be putting the uh, unit into the stretcher or something like that. It gives us a bit more flexibility for where uh, the inlet can be in, and if this was tucked in to the side, it, less risk of this being obstructed, but we do need to be careful about that. We then think about the insulated one. This goes on to the large middle one, which is marked outlet. You might need to uh, give it a little push just to make sure that you can see the end of it so that you can wiggle it on. Again, a little bit of firm pressure, make sure it's on nice and form, firm, push the insulation down. We then come to the mask and uh, thermometer unit. Okay, the mask obviously is going to go on to the Casualty. Uh, this particular mask is just a nice soft silicon seal. Some of the ones that we may have may have an inflatable cuff. You may need to um, just open the valve on those to ensure that there's enough air in it, but this one doesn't need it. Um, as I said, we've also then got the thermometer assembly. Um, this is composed of two parts. Generally, they are kept together, but they may become separate. We've got a green elbow and the temperature probe. Temperature is taken here at the end. You'll also notice that there is a hole drilled on one side of this. 
Okay, important that we put the temperature probe in that way. Just again, light pressure ensures it in. And then this, the temperature probe part goes closest to the mask. Okay, this ensures that when we monitor the air temperature, we're actually monitoring the air temperature, sorry, the temperature of the air that's going to the casualty rather than the temperature of the air that's coming off the unit. So we just introduce that gently. You can turn this round so that it's going to be visible to you. There's an important red line marked at 50 degrees centigrade. Okay, that's the absolute upper limit of air, that you, the temperature that you should deliver from the unit. We now pop that into the top and the unit is ready to be given to the casualty. Okay, we want the casualty to just breathe normally. I can, if the casualty was in a stretcher, I can hold this onto the casualty's face. Um, not a problem about that. There's very little breathing resistance to this. Okay, so I'm just going to ask the casualty to breathe normally through the mask. And they should start to feel that they're getting warm, moist air coming into them. You can see the mask fogging up here. OK, so as the operator of this, it's my job to monitor the temperature here. OK, and to think about this little hole that's drilled in the side of um, the green elbow here. OK, so I need to when I'm administering it, I need to be concentrating on this thermometer. As I said, ideally, we want the temperature of the air reaching the casualty to be above 40 degrees or above but less than 50. The red line is at 50 so the 50 is an absolute max. If the temperature reaches that 50 degrees take the unit off the casualty. Okay if I want to try and modify you know the temperature has reached 40 degrees, 42, 43 and I want to keep it there I can use this hole as a sort of a way of allowing a little bit of, um, the, of air, cooler air from the environment in uh, to mix with the air that's coming off the unit and to keep it at a good temperature. So a manual control, finger on, finger off over that hole while the casualty just breathes in and out normally. Okay, and the temperature is coming up nicely there, up to, um, well, nearly 30 degrees already. It may take a couple of minutes um, for the reaction to really get going and uh, for the temperature to come up to that sort of recommended 40 degrees. Um, obviously, we're going to be a little bit guided by the casualty. If they hate having this near their face, you can talk to them nicely, try and encourage them to have them, say why it's good, doesn't it feel better to feel a bit of warm air coming in, all that kind of thing. Um, but if they don't like the temperature and they don't like it, you know, we have to be a bit guided by the casualty. So, you know, it's not a matter of clamping it on and holding it there. Um, you know, listen to the casualty, see how they're behaving. In fact, we're never going to strap the mask on the casualty uh, because of that risk of it, the temperature going too high. It's always going to be manually administered and watched very, very carefully by a dedicated operator. So a final few thoughts about the unit. Um, very important that any time the unit has been disassembled, and moved around, perhaps put back in the case to take it further um, along the rescue route that you use the bottle brush to give it a good clean out. Um, really important also that the inlet is always open and clear. It's not kinked, it's not bent, it's not obscured. We want the casualty to get plenty of you know easy air, their breathing to be easy. Okay, if we're going to recharge with the CO2 cylinder, important that we do that well away from the casualty. Even we can take the mask um, and thermometer element off to ensure that there's no build-up of excess CO2 in here. I give it a little bit of time to dissipate before you give it back to the casualty. Very important that there's a dedicated operator whose job it is to monitor the temperature and to try and mix the air to so that the temperature stays in just above 40 degrees ideally just above 40 degrees and that they're monitoring it and if it gets to 50 that they take the unit away from the casualty allow it to cool down a little bit before giving it back. OK 
okay, important that we emphasize for the casualty that they should breathe normally and that we as the operator don't need an enormous amount of pressure um, against the casualty's mouth just to ensure a good seal there. It's important that they breathe in and out through the unit. Their carbon dioxide helps keep this reaction going. This may get quite warm, so if you do put it inside the stretcher, inside a CAS bag, make sure it's not uncomfortable for the casualty. As ever in any rescue situation, we're going to listen to the casualty. What are they telling us? How are they feeling? Is everything going okay for them? Okay, thanks very much. So we're going to talk today about the three main stretchers that we use in GCRG. So we've got the basket stretcher over here, which is useful in um, mines rescues, or it's also useful for places like Otterpole, where we can take the casualty uh, down a steep slope. We've got the short slick stretcher, which is also known as the Slicks 50. And here we've got a new stretcher that we've just uh, purchased, GCRG, which is the new Slix 100, also known as the Slix Spelio. And I'm just going to run through the contents of the stretcher and we'll have a look at some of the differences between this new Slix and the old Slix 100. So it's pretty similar. Um, we've got the outer bit of the stretcher and we've got the inside bit here which is the spine board so we also keep some extra equipment inside the stretcher so here we have lifting um, lifting slings. These are colour coordinated so the green ones connect to the green holes on the stretcher and the blue ones to the blue holes and that will give us a horizontal hole. We've got um, harness, the full body harness, that's for attaching to the casualty if we have any uh, vertical fall. We've also got the jag rig, which um, Ian and Bump are going to talk about as well. We've got a thermo rest, which uh, will give a bit of added insulation to the casualty. Some extra bits of strapping which are always useful. A big long sling which we can use as a header rope, attach the top or a drag um, rope attached to the bottom. Some goggles which uh, because people have had trouble trying to find these we've now we've now got them in a, a nice bright red bag for you. And in there we've got a pair of gloves, some goggles, and a balaclava. We've also got some bigger goggles in case people have got, um, got glasses. And lastly, we've got an adjustable neck collar and a bit of extra padding. Now you may, might notice that the, the main difference here in this spine board is the fact that we've now got head blocks on here. So these are, they're quite heavy actually. They're um, sort of foam rubbery things with Velcro on the bottom. Um, the rest of the spine board is exactly the same. We have the lumbar pad here, which can be positioned along the stretcher to match the casualty. And the other change, I think this, this top bit here is a lot more rigid, but I think that's because um, we've now got these blocks on there, so they have to have quite a rigid base. 
those uh, holes there are to go by the casualty's ears and they can be stuck on and moved up and down into place and we've got a couple of straps here that will go across and just secure those um, head blocks into place so that's the main difference really with this everything else is the same we've still got our crotch straps and the colour coded straps that go across on the spine board so that all looks pretty similar as far as the outside of the stretcher goes it's all the same we've got um, these straps here these red straps connect the spine board to the main stretcher and they are just uh, just a buckle which feeds through the spine board and onto there now the other difference with this stretcher is that there is a big metal plate now on the back of here um, on the old stretcher uh, I think there was a there was a plastic plate on there but that this is a much more substantial metal plate and I believe that when you've got it all together the head blocks actually stop that problem that we used to have with the top bit bending down on top of the casualty's face. So that's uh, pretty much the, the Slicks 100. Um, if you do take it underground, don't forget it always goes with the cast bag, which is um, this one here. Right, so we'll move on to the Slicks 50 now, the short Slicks, and we'll have a look at that. So here we've got a Slicks 50 stretcher and the contents of this are very similar to the Slix 100. We've got a full body harness and our lifting straps. We've got our red goggles bag. Our pull rope, or uh, sorry, header rope. Bits of strapping. Neck collar. And some padding. We don't have um, a thermo rest in this because it's a uh, because of the nature of the, the stretcher, we might want to take the bottom bit off, which I'll show you in a minute, um, which, you know, you can't put a, a therm rest in there, but we do have bits of uh, insulation. Um, and we've also got a short blanket here that will go with this stretcher. So it's not a full um, CAS bag, it's actually, um, a blanket that just goes wraps around and, and keeps the body warm um, there is a, a new CAS bag that is being developed at the moment by uh, Cave Rescue um, which we might we, we're going to have um, a chance to play with that soon and we'll see how that fits in with the short slicks and the main stretcher but we haven't got hold of that yet in development So, the main difference between the Slicks 50 and the Slicks 100 is that, as you can see, this is a lot shorter. It's also articulated here, so if we want to, we can put this section down. 
And the other thing is that the spine board is built into the stretcher. The straps to the spine board are actually built into the stretcher. You can't uptake this out physically, so that's all one piece. The thing that people get confused about with this stretcher is the skirt bit. So when it's packed in the bag, the skirt is folded up inside and it just looks wrong when you unpack it and a lot of people try to try to undo the skirt and turn it around but you don't need to you can take it off if you have to if you're in a really confined space which is what the stretcher is for but um the skirt stays on really unless you have to take it off it just gives a little bit more flexibility with the legs um, what you have to do is just bend this round it does bend and you can see there's the handles on the outside and when the casualty is in there and all strapped up you can see how that works and this end bit is flexible and can move around which is very helpful if you're in a confined space or um, you need that little bit of extra flexibility to get around corners and things uh, you can haul vertically with it exactly the same as the main stretcher so the haul points are on here this head piece if you remember the other one just folded across but this is a rigid head piece which was tried out and people found that the problem with this was if you're in a passageway and you're hauling somebody along this bit here always gets um gets stuck under rocks and gets trapped and it ended up being a bit of a uh, getting in the way too much so I think they've gone back to the roll top uh, head piece as being a, a, a better design so what we can do with this because it's uh, there's less few handles on it so less people can actually carry this stretcher uh, as I say it is used for confined spaces so if you're using it in that situation then you can't get that many people on to, to manipulate stretcher anyway but when you get into a larger passage what you can do is take the short slicks and put it inside the slicks 100 um, and they're fully compatible and you can just stretcher them in you don't need to take them out of this because remember the casualty when they're in this they're actually in the spine board so you can use this stretcher inside the shell of the Slix 100 and you've still got your, your casualties still um, got their, their spine protected. So here we've got the 650 sat inside our new Slix 100 and totally compatible. You've got your eyelets here that are just get connected again with the uh, the little buckle straps so that will just strap onto there and you just in case the 650 inside the 6100 stretcher the short slicks the slick 50 this is kept inside the stores it's not kept inside the trailer because there are only certain circumstances where we would use this one. The 6100 is kept in the trailer, like I said before, and our old 6100 um, is, has been demoted now to our training stretcher, but it's still going to be all fully packed and ready to be deployed if, if we needed it. If we needed two stretchers, we've got two, two full main stretchers. Um, and our old training stretcher, which is the orange one that you might have seen, is now going to be donated to uh, an overseas rescue team. Uh, it's been refurbished at the moment just to make sure that everything's okay on it and then we're, we're going to donate it. I think that's it for stretchers. I'm going to talk now about the new JAG system. Uh, so it's over to Ian and Bump. Hello, so I'm Ian Healy, the training coordinator for the Gloucestershire Cave Rescue Group and we're going to have a look at our 
um, jag system that we use on our short slick stretcher and other stretchers um, to change the position of the, the stretcher from a vertical position like it is now to perhaps a horizontal position. Sometimes for the casualties um, benefit in terms of their medical needs, they're better off in a horizontal position when you can actually get them into that uh, orientation. Um, other times, obviously, the cave pitch is going to determine what position the, cave, uh, the, the stretcher has to go in. Uh, if it's very short and narrow, you might have to go up vertically to, to get them off the pitch. But a big, wide open pitch, you might want to go horizontal. So we've got a four to one pulley system here uh, with this jag. The bottom two pulleys are just um, pulleys. But at the top, we've got a, um, a progress capture pulley operating with a cam so that it can be pulled tighter and it will then grip this rope. So it's just eight mil rope, but with the four to one that we've got on here, it's um, quite strong enough and it's um, designed for the job. So we're going to go now to a horizontal position. Um, I would be the barrow boy operating this at the stretcher. And this is one of the big advantages of this system in that it's not being operated remotely by the people hauling on the ropes. Um, previously we used to have different team on a red rope, different team on a blue rope. Those were attached to different points on the anchor, so we'd have say blue rope attached here, red rope attached there, and we could actually independently haul on them to, to change the orientation of the stretcher. But it was done remotely, they couldn't see what was happening at the stretcher very easily, and it didn't work so well. Um, everything now is attached to one central uh, pear-shaped myon up here um, and we've kept everything as short as we can so that when we get to the top of the pitch head we're not hitting the pulleys um, before the stretch is properly up. So we'll give it a go, we'll pull on this, um, say four to one pulley, these pulleys are, are sealed ball bearings with uh, about a 90% efficiency rate so uh, it's not too difficult for one person to operate. So pulling on here doesn't require a lot of strength and that way we can change the orientation of the stretcher. And you see we've uh, got them in a lot more horizontal position here. Could go right up, those pulleys are actually more or less touching. We don't want to go too far because it gets difficult to disengage um, when you want to go back to vertical. Okay, so I'm going to hopefully show you a little bit closer here what we need to do to uh, get this to come down. Um, pulley wheels are quite tight together here, um, this is the, the working end I'm going to hold on to and there's a button at the top um, and the, the cam itself and I sort of pinch those but I need to pull down in order to disengage the cam otherwise it's, it's pinching on the teeth there. So pulling down and then that allows it to slip through And then we can let out some uh, slack there, change the position of the stretcher. Something that the new JAG systems have is a protective sock, uh, like a sleeve that comes over these ropes to stop them tangling and getting things stuck in them, the casualties arms or whatever it might be. And that's certainly something that we're going to look at um, doing going onwards is to, to get a, a protective sock to go over there and it keeps this all a bit tidier. So the Jag Rig lives in a little bag here, it says Jag Rig for stretcher. It lives with the stretcher and it's all connected up. Just needs the connecting points attaching to the appropriate place on the stretcher. It's all together out of this bag. One of the purchases that we've made this year is uh, what's called a Schlischmann splint, which is going to replace, or which has replaced, this beast, which is our old traction splint, the hair splint. And it's, uh, as you can see, it's quite a, a bulky. It's not too heavy, but it's quite a bulky bit of kit. And 
the replacement for it is small enough now to fit in with our normal neoprene splints. So it's a bit of a difference in size here. Uh, and because of, because of how small this, uh, this new traction splint is, it can be kept in with the neoprene splints so you don't have to worry about taking two bags or calling for another splint to be called in depending on what the injuries the casualty has so it's much easier simpler kept in with the splints and they're all together so here we have it full set of instructions in there and I know that this is going into the realms of uh, first aid stuff now but you never know when you're going to be asked to come and assist somebody in doing a procedure so it's it doesn't hurt for everybody just to know what we're talking about when we talk about a Schlichman splint it's the traction splint that we use for somebody who's got a broken femur the thigh bone and the traction splint pulls the leg so that uh, the casualty is made much more comfortable um, and we, we only use it when we have a, a fractured femur it's not used for, for other injuries um, but yeah it's a bit of a difference in size so let's see it on a casualty here now and this is the ankle strap the thing that you have to remember with this is that this little uh, I wonder what you call it this this piece here anyway has to stay on the outside of the leg with the hole pointing up towards the head so this piece just goes around the ankle so this bit slots in there goes around the groin And then we use the black toggle here to adjust the length to just where it starts to take a bit of effect. Lock it off. And then we can use this red toggle here, which will put the traction on. So there's a, a, some sort of a pulley system in here which means that you don't have to pull this very hard and it, and it applies quite a lot of, um, of traction. So we just release this screw here and we can pull that up and you can see it's pulling, pulling the leg. I won't pull it too far. Lock it off. And that's it. Um, we have the bit of strap in here as well, which you can use just to apply a bit more stability. So this is applied below the knee. You remember our injuries up here. And there we are. So we can compare that with the old hair splint. So you would have put this on by, this bit goes underneath the buttocks and the traction 
is applied by pulling this length out here and then ratcheting up the straps. So you can see already that well, by the time you've got this on, even if you have it as, as short as it probably would be, you've got a huge bit that still sticks outside the end of the stretcher. Um, and this bit here is always susceptible to being knocked as well. So we have actually, yeah, got a bit of string on there too. So if you, when you're using this one, you always have to make sure that you actually tie it off as well, because this is quite easily knocked when you're, you're transporting somebody in the stretcher. Um, and there's always a risk that the traction comes off and that is extremely painful for the patient. So with the new one, we don't have that problem. So the, the uh, Schlichman splint doesn't extend below the foot. So we haven't got the problem with it hanging out over the stretcher. And also these clamps here, when the casualty is packaged, these are always going to be right inside the stretcher, inside the CAS bag, and they're much less likely to get knocked. How does it feel then, Paul? Yeah, it feels very good. I mean, you, I, can, <laughs> I can feel it applying the traction without a shadow of a day, yeah. you know. So, uh, yeah, it's good. Yeah. Okay, can we get you out then? Yes, please. <laughs>
And if we needed to, we could go straight back to hauling uh, by reattaching this. And setting up a um, sed rig. So what we've got here, we've got a uh, we've got a pet solar rig. Putting the roof on, like so. Get cabbing it up, put it through. Like so. camera on and then through the hole at the bottom put another carabiner and a pulley and putting this pulley on will really greatly decrease the uh, the friction like so are we all ready all set up and off we go When we uh, filmed the first part of this video, it was uh, sub-zero temperatures and we were starting to do lose daylight. Um, and I didn't have time to talk about the handle of the rig in a little bit more detail. So I've come somewhere a little bit warmer to talk about that. Um, this is a slightly newer version of the rig and the spring on this tends to be pretty good. It just returns to the work position, the lock position um, when you let go of it. But something I've noticed is with um, the older versions, sometimes this handle gets stuck up here a little bit um, and it's always a good idea to make sure it's pushed down into that locked position, uh, sometimes referred to as the work position. Um, and that way you can let go of it. It is an auto locking device. It's self-minding. I don't need to tie it off now. Um, I can leave it with a load on there and it's perfectly safe in this position. Right, we've already covered the Little Dragon, one of the systems that we've got uh, within the group for keeping casualties warm and trying in fact to actively warm them. Uh, I mentioned briefly at the beginning of that session the other things we've got. We've got them out now on the table. Um, so what have we got? So we've got passive things to try and stop the casualty losing any more heat. We've got our casualty bag, which is pretty big, thick, good form of insulation. Um, work is afoot to uh, perhaps produce a more modern lighter weight version of that within the BCRC. Other systems we've got to try and insulate and shelter the casualty. Uh, we've got uh, kisses or uh, boffy bags with us. Um, obviously COVID at the moment we're not uh, using those but they are there available um, should we need them and when the situation changes help to provide a little microclimate which is warmer the casualty. Um, we're also going to have um, some foam matting or thermo rest which would go in the stretcher again allows insulation uh, for the casualty from the environment and um, we've also got things like uh, balaclavas in the first aid kits and in the first responder kits um, hopefully as a good caver you've got yourself a hat that you carry with you or a nice buff these are available from the group at a very reasonable price see my colleague at the end later. We also might feed the casualty as well, give them some energy, help their body generate um, some heat. So they're quite sort of passive systems, insulate and shelter, brilliant ways of trying to stop the casualty from getting any colder. Um, but can we do anything to try and actively warm the casualty up? Well, you know, many years ago we might have thought about hot water bottles. These days we've got these uh, nice hot packs which use a chemical reaction. Um, to generate heat. Uh, got a little pack here full of liquid, a um, little steel disc down here. You flex that disc and it starts a chain reaction um, which crystallizes this liquid um, out and generates some heat. Uh, that lasts, will give sort of you know 40 to 50 degrees of heat perhaps um, for maybe half an hour, 45 minutes or something like that and then the pack will look like this at the end. Um, crystalline and hard and cold. So brilliant, we can use these to actually push some heat onto the casualty, perhaps into the armpits where it's nice and warm, maybe across the chest, maybe even in the groin. 
Um, they can be found in Darren drums like this in the appropriate tackle sack, 80 in each Darren drum. So you can imagine that you're using two or three, you've got, you know, two to three hours worth of, of heating those, you've got several of those. Um, but modern technology's moved on, um, heated gilets uh, for the outdoors have been available for s some considerable time. So under the auspices of the BCRC, they, uh, Ian Peachy has started to look at producing a heated jacket um, which might perhaps add to or replace some of this technology. Um, okay, so let's have a look at uh, the heated jacket. The uh, Ian Peachy has designed this and the BCRC have um, produced about six, which is sort of on evaluation with the teams at the moment. Um, obviously it's designed for both perhaps uh, walking wounded, shall we say, um, and immobile casualties. How does it work? What's involved? Well, we've got a, a jacket here, which is, you know, just designed for the core of the body. You know, keep the torso warm. That's really what, it, what it's about. We're not too worried about the arms. We're not too worried about the legs. But important to keep the torso warm. So it's nice, it's flexible, hopefully easy to put on, flip over someone's head. You know, one size fits everyone. It's made out of a very light, modern material. Um, our existing casualty bag for those who've used it in perhaps the more extreme environments like um, otter will know that when it starts to take on water and mud it becomes quite unmanageable also it will feel cold to the casualty if it's up around their face so modern materials uh, lighter weight uh, more water repellent you know are being used uh, in this development so as I said it's a nice sort of gilet style you know fold it over someone's head we put it over um, to easily, not too worried about whether arms need to be out or in, anything like that. Comes down, comes over. We've got Velcro closures, which we can use um, at the back. We've got a neck baffle, which if we need to open it so that we can see things, if we need to close it, we can close it as well. Keep the heat in, um, you know, around the core of that body. Really important. So, what about the um, heating element? Well, on the front here, we've got a pocket. This is where the battery will go, but the heating pad, we flip that over the casualty's head, okay, it goes on this inner pocket here. Okay, connecting the two, there's a little eyelet, so we need to take our heating pad, proprietary as I said at the moment, but there is development within the project to produce a custom one. Um, and first thing to do is to find that little eyelet and to post the battery cable through between the two pockets. In reality, it's likely to be that this will stay in the jacket, you know, once it's packed away dry. But should it be a disassembled for whatever reason, it's good to know how to put it together. So, we get that through, we then make sure that the cable's on the right side of the pocket tuck it in, make sure that it's nice and flat, it goes into all the corners, it's not creased, got to think a little bit about the casualties, comfort, slide it down and in, okay, and then we can seal the Velcro back up. See, at that point we're going to go up and over, and here. so we've got the cable through now to the front pocket, what would we do? Well we want to make sure that the casualty is nice and snug, so they will need to either move a little bit so that we can close the heated jacket around them. There's also a belt here to ensure that it is nice and snug, which we can do. Okay, and then we've got our cable, we've got our proprietary battery pack. Now, these battery packs are said proprietary. There is, um, within the project, uh, the aim to design a nice ruggedized pack um, with good long life for cave rescue. Uh, because it's not ruggedized and it's not waterproof, um, our chairman has kindly um, lent us uh, one of his special aqua packs which is designed to have a cable exiting from it. Um, so the cable goes through the side, make sure you've got enough because you're going to need to connect it up to the battery and then tuck it inside. Okay, so we go that, that goes through the side, that all fits back together, which I'm quite informed is quite a little bit of a fiddle. But um, there we are, so that goes to the side, these clips rotate and then snap close to do that. We can then take our battery, take the protective element off, 
connect it up to the pack and slide the pack in. But for clarity, I'll operate it out. So, okay, so there's two buttons. There's one that says on and up, and there's one that says off and down. That seems pretty straightforward. A short press on uh, the on button turns it on, and you can you won't be able to see in this light, but there's a number one on there now. So this is provides variable power and you can now use the up and down functions to cycle through the power levels that are available and I think there's nine power levels on this. So you might start and think well let's try and get some heat into the casualty so you might start on a quite a high setting but obviously that's going to use the battery up quicker so perhaps after uh, a certain amount of time you might choose to uh, scale that down so that you get prolong the battery life. Once that's all in the pack and sealed up nicely so that it is going to survive our cave environments, we can open the pocket, tuck it in nicely out of the way. As I said, the jacket is designed for both you know, stretcher casualties and um, those who are walking wounded. Easily go on over a furry, provide a little bit of heat that person, you know, turn somebody from who potentially might be a stretcher case into walking with you because we can warm them up. Brilliant modern um, project to uh, design a piece of kit specifically for cave rescue. Excellent.